This lecture is called Like-Minded Souls, which reflects the relationship between the famous artist potter William de Morgan and his wife Evelyn Pickering de Morgan, who will become one of the most important pre-Raphaelite artists of her generation. If you wish to find out more about William de Morgan, please view my free to view lecture on my YouTube site. This lecture is primarily devoted to Evelyn de Morgan's paintings and how she developed a particular vision of pre-Raphaelitism at the close of the 19th century. Rather in the way that de Morgan, William de Morgan, has a fascinating family history, so does Mary Evelyn Pickering, always known as Evelyn. In fact, many people thought that she was a boy when she was at the Slade, and rather cruelly suggested that was why she won so many prizes. She is the daughter of Percival Pickering, a QC, who was recorder of Pontefract, where the licorice comes from. Uh, but most importantly, her mother is Anna Marie Wilhelm, Wilhelmina, I should say, Spencer Stanhope, a really important uh, Yorkshire family. And their ancestral home is Cannon Hall, which you see down the bottom, which allows me just to say a little bit about the De Morgan Foundation. So uh, Mrs. Sterling, who was Evelyn's younger sister, uh, buys up everything that she can in the early 20th century related to either William or to her sister Evelyn to create the De Morgan Foundation. It was uh, displayed at Old Battersea uh, Hall uh, for many, many years, but then th that uh, had to be uh, given up. It was leased. And then there was... Uh, uncertainty as to what would happen to the De Morgan Foundation. It went into storage for many years. And then there was a purpose-built uh, facility created for it at West Hill, on sort of Bat near Battersea, that side of London. But that too, I'm afraid, came to grief. Uh, government cuts, I think it was closed around about 2012. And from that point onwards, the De Morgan Foundation has not had a permanent home. However, um, this has had a, a silver lining because it means that the collection is now split. The, some of the luster wearers at the Ashmolean, there's a large display at Cannon Hall, and then there is Whittick Manor, where the malt house has been turned into a De Morgan uh, museum, in effect. And then the Watts Gallery also has a large display of both pots and paintings. So we're seeing here the rather doer looking character um, is Evelyn's uncle. So... Anna's brother is the great pre-Raphaelite painter, John Rodden Spencer Stanhope. They're iron founders, I think that's where the money comes from, originally the Stanhope family. And um, if you're wondering where Cannon Hall is, it's very close to Barnsley. He was, this is uh, Spencer Stanhope, the pupil of G.F. Watts. And so this is Little Holland House. He is, this is Little Holland House. He's part of the Little Holland House circle. Um, this no longer exists. Uh, the whole estate, you know, it's Holland Park was completely redeveloped and this was pulled down um, in the late 1870s. Some have even speculated that's Burne Jones on the lawn as he was a frequent visitor to Little Holland House and was even in residence for a few years recovering from ill health. Uh, G.F. Watts is down the bottom. G.F. Watts went to Little Holland House for a cup of tea and stayed for around about 25 years. When it was pulled down, he then created his own house on Melbury Road. So this is again showing you the co quite complex interconnections of the Victorian art world, pre-Raphaelites uh, through to Olympians, as we refer to G.F. Watts and Lord Leighton. So this is just to remind you really of where Evelyn is coming from. She is at the heart of the aesthetic movement, and then the emergence of symbolism in the late 1880s and 90s. What's his love and death? This is, I think, the Manchester version of 1875 was Oscar Wilde's favorite painting. And uh, slightly earlier, 1871, for this and Demophon, uh, one of my favorite works by Burne Jones, that got him into a lot of trouble at the old Watercolor Society, um, because of course it does indeed um, show a fully nude demophon. They are going to benefit both uh, Watts and Burne Jones from the opening of the Grosvenor Gallery, which will be seen as very much the haunt of the East Seats. So this uh, shown, in fact, at the first Grosvenor Gallery exhibition 
Grosvenor Gallery was opened on Bond Street with money supplied by Sir Coots Lindsay and his equally rich wife, Lady Lindsay, who was a Rothschild. They set it up as uh, a rival to the Royal Academy, as they felt that the Royal Academy was not representing the best in modern British art uh, in the 1870s. So this is his beautiful Love and the Maiden. And this is now in the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. Uh, and you can see it's, it's very close stylistically, I think, to, more to Burne Jones uh, than to, to G.F. Watts. There's that uh, wistful pre-Raphaelite medievalism blended uh, with classical mythology. So Evelyn starts her career at the South Kensington School. She couldn't go to the Royal Academy. That didn't admit women at this time. But then there is this big breakthrough with the opening of the Slade, first under the watchful eye of Sir Edward Poynter, Burne Jones's brother-in-law. And we know that uh, Evelyn was enrolled at the Slade by 1873. It was actually opened with money uh, from uh, Felix Slade in 1871, as in the Slade Professor of Art uh, History, I think it is now at Oxford. So here it is that in, you can see here all the lady artists, it admitted lady artists, though they could only go to draped life classes. And here they are all copying from reproductions of famous marbles, uh, the plaster cast, which was so important, which you can still see in the V&A and, of course, at the Ashmolean. There's the building in the background. I like that. Uh, so in her year, in her cohort, we have Mary uh, Stuart Wortley, a great friend of Burne Jones and one of the figures on his famous Golden Stairs. Mary Fraser Teitler, who would eventually marry uh, G.F. Watts. Um, Evelyn Pickering, who obviously will marry and become Mrs. Uh, Evelyn de Morgan. And then uh, Mary Josephine a Hardcastle, Lady Monkswell, who you see down the bottom, uh, never rose above her amateur status as an artist, but most importantly, leaves the most wonderful diaries, telling us a lot about life in artistic circles in Chelsea. And her brother-in-law, this is Lady Monkswell, her brother-in-law is the Honourable John Collier, also part of the Chelsea set. And Mary has a famous brother, Archibald Stuart Wortley, who is alleged to be John Everett Millet's only uh, genuine pupil. Now, I know this is very complicated and you're thinking, goodness me, I'm not going to really cope with all of that. But my reason for introducing all of these figures is to show you again the sort of interleaving of the Victorian art world and how fascinating it is to study it. You know, you suddenly find that somebody gets a job because he's the friend of somebody's brother. So you could describe this again as the current climate uh, nepotism, but it was how the Victorian world worked. And there's obviously a very clear synergy between the paintings of Evelyn de Morgan and those of Spencer Stanhope. So here, the angel with the serpent is one of her, his, her earliest identified works. If it's not got where it is next to it, it means it's in the de Morgan Foundation. And her model, by the way, for this rather charming young man with his pink wings was her brother, Spencer Pickering. And next to it, I've got from 1877, so a good close uh, you know, relationship, we've got Eve Tempted by Spencer Stanhope. And it has been commented that although these nudes are beautiful, they have a purity to them. They're not really sensual. If you were to compare it to a French nude, uh, you'd get what I mean straight away. We'll talk more about her models uh, later. So in August 1875, De Morgan sold, this is Evelyn De Morgan, sold her first work. It was based on the famous work by Verrocchio, Tobias and the Angel, because from 1875, Evelyn is often to be found in Florence studying Renaissance art and staying with her uncle, who had the, you know, fabulously wealthy family, had the resources to basically live in Italy. Oh, how I wish. You can see here, this is really why they are called pre-Raphaelites. Many people are very confused by the term. Do not be. It's really quite simple. They like the art before Raphael. They didn't have any real major beef against Raphael per se. They didn't like the way that academic art had sort of moved away from realism, as they like to describe it, uh, towards the ideal. So they like the artists in Italy of the Quattrocento, 
particularly uh, Verrocchio, Filippo Lippi, and Friar Angelico. And in the north, they like Jan van Eyck, Memling, and Roger van der Weyden. I love the Verrocchio. They are going to blend Greek mythology with medievalism. This is very much the way that uh, Burne Jones develops his art in the 1880s. But they are also incredibly influenced by a Botticelli, who becomes a sort of pin-up star um, in the 1870s. So here is Cadmus and Harmonia, which was shown in the Dudley Gallery. So this is just before the opening of the Grosvenor, and is based on Ovid's Metamorphosis. Cadmus is changed into a serpent by Mars, and his wife Harmonia begs for a similar fate, which is granted. And you can see the pose of Harmonia here um, is very close to Botticelli's Birth of Venus. And this is actually included in the recent uh, Botticelli exhibition at the v &A. So I said there was something of a cult of Botticelli in the 1870s. But in fact, the National Gallery had been buying them since 1857. They got on a bit of a spending spree, in fact, in 1874. Disraeli was very keen on, on Botticelli. Um, and uh, they bought five of his works in the end. And this is perhaps the most influential, bought in 1874, of Venus and Mars. Look at those amazing folds in her dress, uh, the stylization of her hands and her feet and her face. And you can find this not only in, of course, De Morgan's paintings, but also those of Burne Jones. The phallic symbolism is something that the Pre-Raphaelites rather suppressed. So I think you probably already know about the helmeted fawn in the background and the large lance that he's holding, um, blowing straight into Mars's ear to wake him up to get on with the job. Venus and Mars. Anyway, Ariadne at Naxos is her first exhibited work at the Grosvenor Gallery and shows a, a rather forlorn, in fact, Ariadne abandoned. The more normal point in the story was Bacchus coming along uh, to sort of rescue her. Please note all the shells. They are a frequent a feature of de Morgan's uh, paintings, again, perhaps pointing back to Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Anyway, a rather sad looking Ariadne. And then 1878, all of these are shown at the Grosvenor Gallery. You can see here uh, Venus and Cupid. And again, look at the shells on the ground. Again, a reference back to Aphrodite uh, being born, I you know, Greek name as opposed to Venus, being born of the foam of the sea. So she was clearly hugely influenced by Burne Jones, who was the star of the Grosvenor Gallery. After Phyllis and Demophon was given a pasting by the critics for being fully nude, Burne Jones disappeared off of the art scene for something like seven years. He did not exhibit between 71 and 77. But then when the of the opening of the Grosvenor Gallery, he became the star of it. And his most important works were shown there. So this is his famous Tree of Forgiveness. It's based on Phyllis and Demophon. But as you can see, we've now moved into what I refer to as his Michelangelesque phase with these wonderfully superhuman bodies of the type we can only dream of. Uh, Dryad is also, you can see here the link that I've made between the figure of the Dryad emerging from the tree Phyllis has been transformed, Ovid again, metamorphosis, but transformed into the tree, having been deserted by her lover, Demophon. So her, her, Evelyn de Morgan's, very good education. She was educated at the same level as her brothers. She was fluent in three or four languages. She went, of course, to the South Ken schools, then the slave, then travelled extensively in Italy. So she had the sort of education that you would associate with a Victorian man. So this little section here is to do with metamorphosis. So we've got the Dryad. One of my favourites is Clytie. Um, this was a very popular emblem in Victorian art. Poor Clytie is transformed into a flower that turns with the sun um, because of her unrequited love for Apollo. She was equated by the aesthetes with the sunflower. So you can see here, this is the route that de Morgan has gone down. Whereas the famous painting by Lord Leighton has a much more human Clytie before her transformation, uh, looking towards Apollo 
uh, who she longs for. And the portrait bust is by G.F. Watts, where again, Clytie is straining towards the sun. So I'm trying, trying to show you how De Morgan's themes are pretty typical of the aesthetes and symbolists of her generation. This too might have been inspired by Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus, as it's on the theme of, of the sort of zephyr, the wind, night and sleep. And this whole little clutch of paintings, again, um, relates to this theme. There's a rather Leonardo-esque barren landscape below our two figures of night and sleep. These can also be related to her general interest in death. Again, symbolists are always drawn uh, to that subject. But in the case of de Morgan, this is highlighted by her intense interest and increasing interest in spiritualism. As we will see, this just grows after her marriage uh, to William de Morgan, when she was clearly influenced by her mother-in-law, uh, Sophia. So Aurora Triumphans, which is in the Russell Coates collection, I'm trying to show you how important it is you to really see a de Morgan in the frame. The frames were made for her specifically in Italy and are far superior, I have to say, to frames made in London at the same time that had to copy the Italian ones. The Italian ones are much more richly carved, much more three-dimensional. Originally, this was bought by Hubert Russell Coates, not Merton, the founder, as a Burne Jones and given a spurious date of 1876. We know, of course, that it was shown at the Grosvenor Gallery uh, 10 years later in 1886 and shows at night and day and these wonderful angels with their pink wings heralding of the dawn. So these are all to do my theme here because you can't really differentiate when she's got her style and her subject matter. She's going to go back to the same themes throughout her life. So I've, I've divided it more by theme than anything else. So metamorphosis, we started with Clyte and the dryad. Now we're looking at the theme of sleep and uh, dreaming and death. Uh, these two relate to it because this is morning star, phosphorus and uh, hesperus, uh, who is the evening star. And can you see how very similar again the landscape in the background is to uh, Botticelli's Birth of Venus? Just to remind you here, look, this a uh, very stylized um, line of the interconnection between land and sea is very like uh, de Morgan's own painting. And then the shells down the bottom, it's again, seems to be the shell becomes a very uh, overtly feminine symbol for her of, of creativity and rebirth. So as a spiritualist, she was particularly fascinated by immortality. So um, her idea really is that the soul is trapped in the body and that we all long for the transmutation of flesh into soul. Uh, also, there was a huge uh, mortality rate amongst children. Uh, de Morgan himself suffered the loss of his sister, Annie, who was married to uh, Dr. Reginald Thompson. So um, TB stalks the land in terms of always sort of being present in the back of de Morgan's mind. And this is the reason why in the 1890s, they spent half the year in Florence. So here is sleep and death. There is the framed version and then uh, the close up showing you the concentrating really again is the crescent moon in the background. There's the Botticelli in fluttering draperies. And then the, uh, the way in which the torch is extinguished, the death, uh, sleep, all this. And then, but again, look at the shells on the ground and a rather Leonardo-esque um, landscape in the background. So sleep and death sort of go together. The Angel of Death of 1880, a beloved theme of G.F. Watts as well. And one of the interesting technical developments is her interest in using gold so the drawing, um, which recently went through the auction rooms, which dates to the middle of the 1880s, is um, gold on brown paper. And she's experimenting with the use of gold in the way that Burne Jones was. And again, you could spend hours identifying the flowers, the cypress trees in the background, again, are symbols of immortality. Um, but, you know, it's like Death and the Maiden, the famous uh, work uh, by Burne Jones. Then in August 1877, uh, they meet socially at a, a dinner party. 
uh, Evelyn meets De Morgan, they get engaged. It's, it's a protracted affair, as you can see, engaged in 1885. And they don't marry until 1887. Uh, de Morgan rather amusingly quips that he'd waited 18 years uh, for Evelyn to be born, but we haven't quite worked out where the maths comes from for that. But, you know, long engagements were pretty typical in the 19th century. And remember that Evelyn is from a very wealthy background and her family, the Stanhopes, must have been very alarmed that she was marrying a potter. So here we have uh, from the Rob Dix Dickens collection at the Watts Gallery, a rare photograph of a young Evelyn, uh, their final trip to Venice in 1914, and then William at the end with his very distinctive domed shaped forehead. So once they decide to winter in Italy every uh, half a year, approximately spent in Florence, this is when the relationship with Cantigali develops. So here are two fantastic pieces uh, designed and made by William de Morgan in the Maiolica Cantigali style. And then most importantly, I think, the, well, already the intense interest that Evelyn has in symbolism and spiritualism now really develops with the influence of her mother-in-law, Sophia uh, de Morgan. So Sophia de Morgan had already become involved in spiritualist experiments. They often had seances. If you know a little bit about Rossetti, you'll know that he got involved in seances to try and bring back his first wife, uh, the famous Elizabeth Siddle. Uh, in the end, it, they become particular, the de Morgans become particularly interested in automatic writing. So Sophia's book is from Matter to Spirit, a result of 10 years' experience in spirit manifestation. That's the sort of Ouija board end of it, I'm afraid, if I can be a little bit um, uh, critical. But this is, this is an illustration from the book, from Matter to Spirit here in the centre. And then uh, Mrs Sterling, who you remember, is Evelyn's sister, credits the de Morgans with publishing anonymously uh, again, another similar book entitled The Result of an Experiment, again, communicating with spirit beings. And we know that um, Evelyn is actually, the photograph is uh, of her show in her automatic writing mode. And both William and she, most evenings, would practice this particular uh, spiritual experimentation. And certainly paintings like SOS, Save Our Souls, which was painted on the eve of the First World War, shows this much more overt symbolism in her later works and this intense interest in the concept of the soul. There are residences in and around uh, Chelsea. So once he marries Evelyn, he moves out of uh, Cheney Row and they move to the Vale, where they live for 22 years, but unfortunately it's leased. If I had more time, I would... Love to go into depth about the history of the Vale because it has so many famous people who live there. Um, it's the other side of the King's Road. It's now completely redeveloped. They were all chucked out and uh, all the houses pulled down. And at one point, Whistler lived there. And even more importantly, from my point of view, Ricketts and Shannon, the two Charleses, as uh, we refer to them, who were very closely associated uh, with Oscar Wilde. And then having... To leave the Vale, they moved to 27 Old Church Street, Chelsea, uh, which, as you can see, has a plaque, uh, lived and died here in the opening years of the new century. So they are very much uh, linked to Chelsea. So going back to works that now date to the mid-1880s and looking for this sort of development of spiritualism, her intense interest in the soul, I think is how I would put it, and this concept that, you know, we're here as in a mortal shell, but what we really long for um, is a transfiguration. She develops almost a, a feminist uh, viewpoint in some respects because of her interest in um, the, the feminine, uh, the moon, seen here, uh, Luna, Shelley's To the Moon, accompanied this when it was exhibited in 1886 of climbing heaven and gazing on the earth, wandering companionless amongst the stars that have a different birth and ever-changing, like a joyless eye that finds no object 
worthy of its constancy. Rather melancholic, if you don't mind me saying so. Again, wonderful frame. Also, she develops in the 90s very complex allegorical paintings. So this one is the Garden of Opportunity. And I suppose it's sort of designed to make you realise the choices that you have in life. Is it about material wealth, um, status, or is it about self-fulfillment? This is going to be a theme particularly taken up by the McDonald girls. So we've got uh, these two young men who have turned their back on wisdom and learning. She's pulling her hair out. She's got a book next to her. Please notice the owl. And they are moving towards Folly, who is the female figure leading them astray. And she's offering them a silver ball, which on the back has got a death's head. And there's a little devil. You'll see it better in my next slide. Little devil here, looks kind of like De Morgan, um, who is, um, again, showing you that they are moving away from the, from the true path to the castle, away from the mill that represents good, honest, hard work. So on the other side of the silver ball, there is a death's head, a skull. Oh, it's all good symbolist stuff. Or here, blindness and cupidity, chasing joy from the city. Again, it's another very obvious moral allegory. Blindness and cupidity, chasing joy from the city. And here is a very beautiful angel. We'll talk more about her model in just a minute. But here's the cartolino down the bottom. So again, just like Rossetti and Vern Jones and uh, the big daddy of them all, William Blake, there is this desire to link poetry up with painting. The cadence of autumn is of 1905 is still heavily symbolist, but perhaps not quite so moralizing. I love the way, again, you're sort of moving through the autumnal colors. I love this woman here scattering at leaves at the end. And there is that sort of evitability of melancholy here at the end of the year. So in the 1890s, these are some really big um, allegorical pieces. William Emery was one of her most important clients. He will commission uh, several works for her. Um, he is the, one of the directors of the White Star Line, Scottish, but based in Liverpool. Uh, Flora was originally uh, accompanied with the, the lines, I have my dwelling among the mountains of Scotia, which is a reference to William Emery's birthplace. And the language of flowers is really important. So um, joy and love, forget-me-nots, memory, primrose's youth. I mean, they, they all work into the language of flowers. And obviously our figure here is very much based on Botticelli, the birth of Venus, and even more so as she is Flora, the primavera. The loquat plant is in the background here, the fruit, never eaten one. Perhaps you tell me what they taste like. And you can also see in my close up here, the use of gold. So she's experimenting with gold, particularly uh, from the mid 1880s onwards. Here's a nice close up. Now I was fascinated by this because you've got swallows all over. And of course, swallows uh, migrate in spring, so flora, and these beautiful pansies, which are pensy um, in the French, which means thoughts of you. And I don't know, this is just an idea. She might have seen the painting by Strudwick, they're about the same date, but it also relates to the beautiful poem from The Princess, which is a feminist poem, uh, The Princess, because she doesn't want to marry, she wants to lead an independent life. She doesn't want to be fettered um, into a loveless marriage. And so Gilbert and Sullivan's Princess Ida will come out of Tennyson's poem, The Princess. So as you're about to discover, Evelyn was quite forthright in her opinions about women's roles. So she, she refuses to come out. She won't go to court. She doesn't want to get sold off by her family into a arranged marriage. So I, I quite like this idea that the swallows on Flora's scarf might relate uh, to Oh Swallow Swallow flying, flying south. That's a bit of me throwing my two penny worth into the interpretation. The model for Flora and for many of the paintings, including Aurora Triumphants, is Jane Hales, who was the nursemaid of Evelyn's younger sister. That, of course, is Mrs. Sterling. She was just like many of the pre-Raphaelite models, 
from an agricultural working class background. And please note, she's wearing a swallow brooch at her neck. And you're going to see uh, Jane's features in many of the paintings, like Boreas here, uh, which is very clearly inspired by the uh, Primavera by Botticelli, even the sort of jet-like shape of her body. But obviously, oh goodness, how Orinthia um, is sort of much, much more Michelangelo-esque, isn't it? Very close uh, to the Tree of Forgiveness by Vernon Jones. Here's a close-up. This is Jane Hales as the model. Um, Helen of Troy is a pair, as you'll see in a minute. Um, her interpretation of Helen of Troy is that she is totally innocent, guiltless in terms of what befalls her and befalls Troy. All the roses and, of course, Aphrodite on the back of the mirror. But she sees Helen of Troy as a victim of love. Cassandra, and these are both owned by William Imre. Cassandra is seen to be a sort of like a foil because Cassandra upsets the gods. Um, she's given the um, power of prophecy, but the, unfortunately nobody will believe her. So here she is tearing her hair out uh, with Troy burning in the background. And I'm showing you a close up here of the Trojan horse. So even when she chooses a mythological subject, She's sort of choosing it with a sort of rationale in terms of its allegorical meaning. So this is William Imre's fantastic house, the Homestead in Liverpool. And I'm just showing you where, you know, where all of this would end up. So you can't see an Evelyn de Morgan painting, unfortunately, in this view. But you can see, of course, the Burn Jones Tree of Forgiveness, one of her uncle's paintings there, Spencer Stanhope, and de Morgan tiles in the fireplace. Yes. I've ticked most of my buttons. Uh, here, however, we can see uh, the paintings of uh, William Henry owned by uh, Evelyn de Morgan. As you can see here, there's the Dryad in the corner. This is a Rossetti, uh, it's the small version of Dante's Dream. You'll see the angels in a minute. And here is a beautiful Burne Jones stained glass window, which is actually still in situ. It's the Cecilia. This was the music end of the drawing room. And I think those are De Morgan tiles, but the window has survived in situ as the property is now divided into flats. There's the dryad again. So here is Gloria in Excelsis Deo. I do love their wings, peacock wings. I've got a big thing about peacocks. Evelyn painted eight pictures which will make their way into Imre's uh, collection. Eos, uh, which was the goddess of dawn, is now in the Columbia Museum of Art. Again, you can see here the sort of symbolism of this, she has an intense interest in angels. They're all part of this idea of the transmutation of body uh, into soul. And those very important roses down the bottom. The little sea maid is part of a triptych. Uh, she signs the Declaration in Favour of Women's Suffrage in 1889. She's often described as a suffragette, but I've never come across her in that context. I've come across her as a suffragist, part of Mrs. Fawcett's brand of demanding suffrage for women, which was far more genteel, was nowhere near as militant. And as you know, there were these two opposing forces, the suffragists under Mrs. Fawcett, and the suffragettes under Mrs. Pankhurst. In the first of the sort of like trilogy here, the sea maidens, we see the little sea maids with her sisters. Here we have her longing to lose her tail and develop her feet. Uh, but unfortunately, as you've, if you've read the story by Hans Christian Andersen, you know it doesn't end well um, because she cannot declare her love to the prince. The prince marries another woman. She then is encouraged to kill the prince to get her soul back, that she loves the prince so much that she commits suicide instead. At the moment that she commits suicide by leaping into the sea, she is transformed into air. So Daughters of the Mist, believe it or not, though painted much later, uh, makes up this trilogy or triptych on the sea made theme. So quite a few of her paintings seem to be about um, what you and I would call feminist issues. This idea of marrying for position and status really coming to fore in the gilded cage uh, where the woman is looking out at life. She's got all of the earth's uh, riches, but none of its freedoms. Here's a close-up to show you just how beautifully painted it is. Almost beautiful, sort of like jeweled 
effects of the uh, of this thing around the back of her neck, almost three dimensional. Uh, the prisoner again seems to be linked to this. It's this idea of women trapped in a loveless marriage or in a simply a pawn in an arranged marriage. So she's looking here uh, through the bars of her cage. I love the peacock feather. Again, okay, always an emblem. Well, a vanity, but also because of the story of the peacock shedding its tail and regrowing one. It's, sort of, it's also emblematic of rebirth and resurrection and renaissance. And the soul's prison house is the same theme, you know, uh, though perhaps more um, elusive, because you've got the bars behind and you've got this idea again that we are trapped in our mortal bodies and that, you know, life here, um, we should live it to the full, but it's brief and our real life will begin when, when we are transported to heaven and we become soul. O oh, illuminated, my blind soul, that sitteth in darkness and the shadow of death. Because, of course, uh, belief, so Christian belief, is the way to this transformation. So there are also, on the flip side, quite a few witches. Again, there's, uh, we love these because they have that Pack a punch, so Queen Eleanor, complete fabrication by the way of the story, finds fair Rosamond allegedly hiding in the labyrinth. She's Henry's mistress, and Eleanor will poison her. She has to choose either to, well, she basically has to take the poison that you can see there in Eleanor's hands. We do like our good fan for towels. Look at all the monkeys and the snakes. And then down the bottom, look, all the cupids and the roses all flying away because Eleanor has arrived. And the lovers in the background. Again, a wonderful close-up. All of these, by the way, taken by either me or my husband at the Watts Gallery, or originally in the um, foundation at West Hill. Uh, so Medea, who you remember, I'm afraid, um, Jason and those poor children, a good example, again, of the wronged woman taking her revenge. And that's in the Williamson Art Gallery in Birkenhead. I love the love potion. They're the lovers outside. Is this, is, is this for good or bad? Uh, I have three black cats, so I'm rather fond of the cat down the bottom. The main thing is that they are all this sort of femme fatale, women using their beauty in a, a malevolent way. And the hourglass I find fascinating as it's modelled on Jane Morris. And so you could perhaps see it in, as an allegory of her fading beauty, as obviously um, at the height of her perfection, physical perfection, she is the muse and the lover of Rossetti. But here in the hourglass, her beauty is fading. It's based on this very lifelike portrait of Jane Burden as she was on the uh, close-up of the hourglass down the bottom. And the lovers, again, in the background, the passage of time. So we'll end with the sort of really major symbolist paintings that seem to really relate to the First World War. So they start with the Boer War, in fact, which is 1900 to 1902. The light shineth in darkness, the darkness comprehended it not. The idea is that we should look to God uh, for salvation. Yeah, she's in like a giant aura and the rainbow becomes very important in these later works. Uh, this is a version that's recently passed through the sale room. So said this interest in using gold as a medium. She reminds me of one of the Sistine Chapel, Sybil's prophets. I love the crocodiles and snakes in the water down the bottom. And again, she's in at this halo, this mandalora almond shape behind the rainbow. Our Lady of Peace uh, here with the uh, knight at the bottom and, and Victoria Dolorosa, which is, is earlier, very Burne Jones, Perseus series type, knight in armour and crowned, as you can see. But victory comes at a cost. And Our Lady of Peace, of course, again with this wonderful uh, rainbow of heads coming down. Uh, and then as a pacifist, she was obviously opposed to the First World War and the Boer War. Her major works relating to this include the Red Cross, which you see here, which I think is the most successful and perhaps the most potent. As you can see here, the Red Crosses of the Belgium field stretching endlessly, the graves of the war dead. Uh, then you'll see SOS in a minute, but both appear to have been influenced by the poem by Emile Camer 
of the voice in the desert, you know, this idea of the devastation left behind due to the Belgium in particular being the principal theatre of war. I think the Red Cross works in a way much better than SOS. You see it here, Save Our Souls, uh, within its frame and without. And I really want to emphasise how important other frames are, because the frame, in a way, is an extension of her vision. So the original frames are really important. And then In Memoriam seems to relate very much to her, her headstone, uh, which is at uh, Brookwood, uh, designed uh, by her, but carved by Sir George Frampton, and with lines from that alleged, uh, well, the anonymous book that Mrs. Sterling alleged they wrote on experiments with spiritualism. Sorrow is only of the earth. The life of the spirit is joy. <laughs>